Welcome to this video on abstract classes and interfaces. My name's Andy Wicks. Before I get going, let me explain that abstract classes are not the same as abstraction in object oriented programming. They're two completely separate concepts that, well, are there primarily, of course, to confuse people. In this video, we're going to look at how to make your life a little more logical as a programmer. And the more logic there is in what you do, the easier it is to program, and obviously the easier it is to debug too. Let's suppose that I want to create a class that gives the user the time, day, date, and so on. I'm going to call this class my time. And I want to ensure that when the user uses this class, they create a, a method called display. Display will output the result. But how the user displays it, well, that will be different for each particular program. So I don't want to put the code in here. I want the user to be able to say which code they want in there. But I want to be sure that they do have a display method. Now you've seen this before when you've extended JFrame and you're forced to have an action performed method. The action performed method is created in exactly the same way as we're creating this here. What we're going to have is something called an abstract class. And an abstract class has methods declared in it that don't have any code, but they're declared as abstract. And that means that the user must implement them when they create their program. So I'm going to have public abstract void display, and I'm going to ensure that the user has a display method in their program. I can also create other methods that are coded. So for example, public static string get time. Get time returns the time in a particular format. And public static string get date returns the date with the day of the week as well. So that is fairly standard Java. Let's have a look at how it's implemented. For that, we're going to go and create a little digital clock. Here in the digital clock program, I'm going to create the program, public class digital clock, and I'm going to extend my time. In other words, I'm going to inherit all the methods and all the variables from my time. Now, my time doesn't have any variables, so that's okay. I can leave that as it is. But it extends my time, and because my time has the abstract class in it, you'll notice that down here I have at override, which means that we're creating another instance of, and then void display is the method that I'm forced to implement by the abstract class. Now in my case, what I'd like to do is to create a variable called time, which includes the date and time for now. And it does this every second. That's what the bit above does with the timer and so on. That we're not interested in in this video. What we're interested in here is that the public void display must be there because it was in our mytime.java. So let me show you this running. Now it's fired and fired again and so on. You can see that every second it's printed out the time and date. Not a difficult program. An interface is something similar. Let me show you an interface, a really complicated one. OK, I'm lying to you as usual. You can usually tell when teachers are lying, their lips move. In an interface, what we do is create the same sort of abstract methods as we did in the abstract class, but in this case, there are no methods 
no variables that are implemented. It just consists of abstract methods. Abstract methods must be instantiated, as we said before. So let me go back to my digital clock program and show you what happens when I use this interface. It's called new interface because, hey, it's new. We can have on the end here implements new interface. And you'll notice that in NetBeans, digital clock one is now underlined in red. It looks as if we've made a mistake, but we haven't. What we have to do is to implement all abstract methods. In other words, those two methods that were there in new interface, first and second. When I click on this, I now get the two new methods appearing at the bottom. Here are the two new methods, first and second. First was just a method, and in there we would do whatever it is we want it to do. At the moment, obviously, it's not coded, so it's throwing an unsupported op operation exception, but that's fine. We can just override that with comments if we don't want to program it yet. And the second one, well, that's a function, returns a string and takes in an integer, which it's going to call x. You've seen that sort of thing with the action performed method that you have to have if you create a graphical user interface. You can create the methods with whichever return types and inputs that you want your programmer to implement. That's entirely up to you. But, and there's always a but, there is one problem. The problem is that whilst you can implement as many interfaces as you like, you can only extend one class. They may say, oh, that's what we're doing. That's fine. Doesn't matter to us. Ah, but that becomes a problem if you want to have a graphical user interface. A graphical user interface extends JFrame. And then you've got a problem with my time. How do you cope with that? And that's the subject of the video on multiple inheritance.